All right, we're going to get started so that you can all get out on time and get back to billable hours, which I remember not so fondly. I'm Carrie Seymour. I'm a professor at Case Law School, and I teach a second year required course in contract drafting. Case is one of the few schools, although it's a, it's a growing trend, that in addition to the traditional first year memo brief writing research class, we require second year law students to take a course on representing clients in transactions and actually drafting the contracts. Um, and there are three of us who teach the class because we have to get every second year student through it and we've had tremendous success. We now have students attending a transactional law meet like a moot court but for transactional lawyers and what we're going to talk about today are some of the principles that you pro some you probably know, some you probably um, know but perhaps don't observe, and these are the things that we're teaching the new lawyers in terms of best practices for contract drafting. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me with questions, um, especially if I'm not making sense, which my students tell me ha happens more often than not. Thankfully, I do not have a blackboard, so you do not have to suffer through my handwriting as my, as my students do. When we're talking about contract drafting, for me, I think that there are, th there are three major goals. Obviously, I have it written as a goal to embody the terms of your client's deal. I take that as a given. The client gives you the terms of the deal. You probably do some brainstorming as to other terms of the deal. But that's obviously the purpose of the contract is to embody the terms of the deal. But when you're thinking about your drafting choices, I think there are three main goals. Brevity, clarity, and making the document user friendly for the client. And I think this last one is probably the one most overlooked by clients is, is thinking, especially in terms of a long-term contract, a supply contract, a franchise agreement, something that's going to last over a period of years, your clients are going to be pulling that document out and using it. And they don't want to have to call you every time and say, now, what does Section 12 say? They'd like to be able to pull Section 12 out when they have a question about their relationship with the other party and be able to understand it themselves. Um, we're going to start with brevity. Um, Brevity is that, and who among us hasn't had the question from the client, can you get that on one page? Uh, every client would like every contract to be on one page. I don't think that that's a request that you can usually honor and still protect them. I could write a contract on one page. It would omit, say, maybe half of the stuff that would protect my client in the event of litigation. But given the fact that clients like to have things on one page or, okay, one and a half, Focusing on brevity in contract drafting is a really important goal. If you, even if you can't get it on one page, it should be as short as necessary. Say what you need to say and get out. That keeps the paperwork down, keeps the bill down, and it makes the document easier for the client to use. So let's talk about some tips for, for contract brevity. And I have some examples here for you. Um, my, first, my first brevity tip is Never use three words where one will do. Probably the lawyer's greatest problem is, especially when you're using documents that have been on your, your firm's system for years, back in the day, they used six words where one would do. And if you haven't updated those, those documents, you find yourself using them over and over again. The example that you have here is a release. Uh, whereas, in consideration in exchange for $10,000 and other good and sufficient consideration, the aforementioned being over or above and in addition to whatever compensation, pay, or consideration is otherwise here, and be, do, I, do I need to go on? Uh, <laughs> what's, what's wrong here? Let me count the ways. Uh, there are every single possibility for using three words instead of one you can find in this document. Um, in consideration and in exchange for. You don't need them both. In consideration for says, says everything you need. In exchange for says everything you need, but you don't need them both. Over, above, and in addition to. Any and all contract, covenant, agreement, and understanding. To the contrary, inconsistent with, or contradict. All of those things you see in documents that you use every day. It's not necessary, and it would make contracts a heck of a lot easier to use and as you're looking forward if you ever if your client ever ended up in litigation not that you're, that's where your client wants to be remember that the audience that's going to be looking at the contract might ultimately be a jury 
all of that repetitive language only makes it harder for a jury to understand the document. And especially in contract interpretation, what you're, what you're inevitably arguing to the jury is, oh, it's so clear. It's so clear that this contract says that my client should prevail, or my client didn't have to do this, or did have to do this, or, or whatever it is. Um, to the extent that you're using those sorts of things, you're also not helping the goal of, of clarity. So now, interestingly, I think it's probably releases where you see this sort of language most often. Why is that? With releases, your client is paying for peace. And nobody wants to be the person who, whose client says, wait a minute, I paid this guy $10,000 and he's still suing me. How did that happen? Well, I didn't kitchen sink the language. I mean, I think in releases, lawyers tend to kitchen sink the language because they want to be absolutely sure that their client is buying peace. A laudable goal, but I think all of us are capable of eliminating repetitive language in order to make the document shorter. Question? that little interstitial area where they go up oh, this word's missing so I can give I cannot enforce the release right I'm just throwing that out that a lot of the verbiage comes from trying to overcome case law that was just Where, bad for what you're trying to accomplish right oh no and I and I think that's I think that's especially true of releases I think that that the you know it's so important that your client not pay money and then still get sued that you get this kind of language but I I guess the I guess my answer would be certainly there are places to do this judiciously. I don't think you're going to have a release overturned because you didn't say in consideration and in exchange for, right? There are times where now for instance, one of the things in this is null void and of no force and effect. Without going to blacks, how many of you could tell me the difference between null and void? I'm not sure I could. So there are places where I might use the synonyms to be absolutely sure, but the places where it's obvious that they're completely repetitive, I think it behooves us as lawyers to say, we're trying to make this more accessible both to our clients and to members of the public and to eliminate language that's completely repetitive. If you feel you need it for a legal reason, absolutely keep it in, but make the judgment that you need it, not, I don't know, we've always said it this way. And, and, and the documents continue to remain dense and, and, as I say, inaccessible to clients. So that's my first brevity tip. Never use three words where one will do. The second one, our second example, in order to file a claim with respect to injuries, this is from a collective bargaining agreement, all of these, I didn't make these up. Uh, with respect to injuries that have occurred in the course of the workday, the employee shall submit documentation that he incurred medical costs that are in excess of $100. In the event that the employee claims that the injuries will cause a permanent disability with the result that the employee can no longer work, the claim will be held in abeyance until the permanent disability claim is decided. This paragraph is full of something which I think we've all probably drafted into documents, full of compound prepositions, right? In order to file a claim, what's the one word instead of that, that compound preposition? In order to. To. With respect to injuries, with respect to regarding, for, one word, in the course of, during, absolutely, in excess of, over, more than, right, exactly. We've just knocked out 10 or 12 words out of this. My personal favorite is in the event that. Anybody? If, right. In the event that is, is a lawyer's favorite phrase that, that doesn't get you anywhere and could be with one word instead of, instead of three. Think about the compound prepositions, and, and you would probably not say these things if you're talking out loud. Write as you would talk in terms, of, in terms of brevity. Compound prepositions are another place where you can shorten up your documents a, a lot because it happens all the time in legal writing. Uh, similarly, you have word-wasting idioms. Uh, he was aware of the fact that, he knew, despite the fact that, although, 
because of the fact that, just because, and you can see the other, the other examples of that um, in the materials, but it does not make your writing any more learned, any more lawyerly sounding to use all those word-wasting idioms, and all it does is increase the length of the document. So my third tip for brevity, for reaching our goal of brevity in contract drafting, is ordering obligations. Good organization provo promotes brevity, and I can't, I can't emphasize enough that I think, especially with documents you've been using off your systems, I mean, and, and you do draft, draft documents from scratch, in which case you control the organization from the beginning. But to rethink organization and look at it from the user's point of view of the document. If I were, if I were the non-legal user of this document, where would I look for this information? Uh, that I always tell my students, you, you should either think, how does this deal flow, or think in terms of chronology. That's how regular people think about events. If you have a, if something ha in a supply contract, somebody places an order, somebody delivers, then we have problems with the order, then we have payment. If you're, a, if you're one of the parties to that supply contract, that's how you live your life, that's how you think about that deal. Starting with payment up front doesn't match the normal human's view of how the, of how the, view, of how the world works. So I think that either how a deal flows or chronology is your best uh, method of organization. But let, let's take an example here. This is a, a delivery paragraph. Buyer will pay $10,000 for the goods. Next, buyer will accept delivery of the goods at the Galveston Rail Terminal, although seller will provide at least 10 days notice of the delivery date. In addition, the seller will obtain, a pass, obtain for the buyer a pass into the terminal. On the other hand, buyer will use a bonded common carrier to transport the goods from the terminal to buyer's facility. All sorts of unnecessary transitional words there, right? Next, although, in addition, and trust me, if you're ever writing on the other hand in a contract, grab yourself by the scruff of the neck, say, what are you thinking? Have another cup of coffee and get rid of on the other hand. Uh, the four, four words that should never show up in any, in any contract. But the problem here, the reason this drafter, and this is an actual provision, the reason this drafter used those transitional phrases is that this drafter doesn't have the obligations in the right order, right? First, the seller has to provide notice to the buyer of the delivery date. And before the buyer can pick it up, the buyer should have the pass into the Galveston Rail Terminal, right? He can't get in there to accept delivery until he has the pass. Buyer pays $10,000 for the goods because the seller's not going to let him transport until he pays for it. And then finally, he uses a bond and common carrier to transport the goods from the terminal to the buyer's facility. So it is much shorter and way more user friendly for the client if you order obligations in the way they occur instead of trying to string them together with transitional words. So think about good organization as a method to promote brevity. Questions? Anybody? Okay. One of my favorite tools to promote brevity is the use of lists. Um, I'm not in favor of contracts that are just one list after another, but I think most documents that I look at could benefit from the use of lists. Lists are a way to eliminate repeated language, uh, uh, helping our, our brevity goal, and also a list is an easy way for the reader to absorb information. Take, let's take the, this compensation in an employment agreement. Employer shall pay employee $5,000 in salary on the 30th of every month. Employer shall also pay employee $250 per month in consideration of home office expenses. Employee shall receive a monthly bonus, if any, in accordance with the company's sales bonus procedures. You have repeated language there. Employer shall pay. Employer shall pay. You don't need to keep saying that. You can shorten the document up. You can see the redraft there. On the 30th of each month, employer shall pay employee, the introductory clause. The repeated language goes in the introductory clause. And then the list elements are the things that the employer will pay the employee. It also, imagine if you were trying to, if, if, if your client were taking this content and trying to say, what do I have to pay this guy? As opposed to looking at the paragraph section five, looking at the list, 
and seeing those elements set out that way a lot easier for the client to use and you haven't had employer shall pay, employer shall pay. Now, those of you who have had your second cup of coffee said, but wait a minute, it only says employer shall pay twice, then it says employee shall receive a monthly bonus. Employee shall receive is, uh, for lack of a better term, what I call a receive covenant. What's the, pro what, what's the legal problem with a receive covenant? Who's doing the act? Right. It doesn't put the obligation on the correct person. If the employee did not get the monthly bonus under this contract, who's in breach? The employee. That's insane. That's not what the parties intended, certainly, right? The employee, the, the employee is simply the recipient of something. It doesn't say who's supposed to do it, and it puts the obligation on the wrong party. So in addition to making this, um, this paragraph brief, it also solves the problem of that receive covenant. I think receive covenants are rampant. If you looked through, if you just did a for shall receive, a find, a, a find on your system for shall receive, you'd see it all the time. Yes, yeah. Right, and, and normally with, with passive voice, you're, it, it's, you know, you take the object of the sentence and, and say that something will happen to it. But a receive covenant is the covenant equivalent of passive voice. It's not putting the obligation on the right party. And uh, it's one of those things that I think happens all the time in legal writing, and, and we need to, to clean that up. Okay. Goal number two for our, our contract drafting best practices is clarity. The very last place that your client wants to end up is litigation. As a matter of fact, your office might be the last place that their client, <laughs> but they need you, so they still come to you, so they don't end up in litigation. And as we all know, every, if there's an ambiguity in a contract, that's when you end up in front of a jury. The, co the court makes the decision whether an ambiguity exists, but resolving the ambiguity is the province of a jury. It's not, especially for a transactional client, that's not the result they want from the contract drafting from you is to end up end up in litigation. So clarity should be, I mean, brevity, I think, is, is a laudable goal. It's one that clients want. It's one that we should strive for. Clarity is absolutely job one. You have, your, your job is to take the, the deal terms and fully express them in the contract, but express them clearly. The, the client should never pick up the contract and say, I read that this way. That's funny. I read it this way. That's the definition of an ambiguity in the contract, and you have the seeds of future litigation. So how do we, what are some of the places, some of the tips for avoiding ambiguity? First, short, simple sentences. It's so easy when you know the terms of the deal to write too much into one sentence. That's fertile ground for ambiguities. For example, with respect to all packaged meat products entering the facility, and might I add that, is there anything less appetizing than packaged meat products? But far be it from me. Okay, with respect to all packaged meat products entering the facility, the delivery dock inspector shall certify that the USDA seal was intact at the time of delivery, or the head cook may conduct bacterial tests, which shall be paid for by seller. Anybody? Ambiguity in that paragraph? How could, the, how could one party read that one way and another party read it another way? Yes. One of the what one of the ambiguities happened. there is that is that dangling mod, that dangling phrase at the end, which says which shall be paid for by seller, is the seller paying for the bacterial tests, or if there's some fee associated with the delivery dock inspector certification, is the seller paying for both? Is the seller paying for one? And if so, which one? Absolutely, that's that's the first ambiguity in that sentence. The second. Whether they're going to certify that uh, the delivery dock inspector is going to certify that the USDA seal was intact or the head cook conduct bacterial tests. It's like one activity or another. Right. Is, is one an alternative to the other? Do, do we have to go to the, uh, to the delivery dock inspector first and we only go to the head cook for bacterial tests if the seal isn't intact or if the delivery dock inspector isn't available? Or 
could we say, oh, what the heck, the delivery dock inspector's down on dock five, we'll just go to the head cook. There's, there's no indication here about the relationship between those two tests. And that arises because it's all jammed into one sentence. Instead, what you should say is, with respect to all packaged meat products entering the facility, the delivery dock inspector shall certify that the USDA seal was intact, period. If the USDA seal was not intact, or depending on the terms of your deal, or if the delivery dock inspector wasn't available, the head cook shall conduct bacterial tests, period. Third sentence for the third topic, payment. The seller shall pay for, and then depending on what the seller pays for, one or the other, but all those ambiguities are wiped out by using short, simple sentences rather than trying to pack too much information into one sentence. Easy to do, especially when you're familiar with the terms of the deal. It's very hard to see the ambiguities when you know the terms of the deal and you're writing them in one big sentence. So every time you can stop yourself and say, this does, is, could this be read differently? And am I taking different deal terms and packing them all into one sentence? You'll greatly reduce the number of ambiguities in your writing. Dangling modifiers. This, the first example is the one we just talked about. Which shall be paid for by seller? That, that, that phrase at the end, you, know, you don't know which one it applies to. Example two, contractor shall install a loading dock with a slope ramp on each side and it will be 18 feet long. Yes? Or the ramp, absolutely. And, and again, if we say contractor shall install a loading dock with a sloped ramp, period, contractor shall build the loading dock to be 18 feet long. Two sentences resolves the ambiguity. Adding, add, trying to add that sentence, or trying to add that modifier at the end leaves you with an ambiguity in there which you would hope doesn't end up in litigation over an 18-foot over loading ramp. But um, we've seen the hot coffee in the, lamp, in the lap case. Nothing is outside the realm of possibility. Uh, example three, if damage during shipment between Boston and New York, the standard rail car on which the goods were loaded at Boston will be replaced with a Conrail Super Shock rail car for further shipment to Washington, D.C. Car is damaged. Exactly. Exactly. You don't have any. Which, which one of those has to be damaged before you get a super shock rail car. My, my thought is that if you're talking about a car that has super shocks, you're probably talking about the goods being damaged. But in this case, this, this provision would not answer that question. So you need to take that also and break it down into a couple of sentences. There's also there's an, another interesting, there is a, a place ambiguity in this. Anybody see a place ambiguity between Boston and New York? Are you saying between what happens, what happens in Boston and or New York? Exactly. Between is a is a word that is the cause of more ambiguities than you can shake a stick at. Between means what it says. It does not include the two things at either end. So here if they were damaged within the city limits of Boston or within the city limits of New York, the argument would be there's no need for a Conrail Super Shock rail car because it said between Boston and New York. Now, do you, think, do you honestly think that that's what the parties meant? That one foot outside the city limits of Boston and one foot outside the city limits is, is what they were trying to protect? No, they were trying to protect terminal to terminal. But the use of the word between is, is both in, in and we're going we're gonna to talk about this in a few minutes, both in terms of place and in terms of dates is one of those, when you, when you find yourself writing between, you should ask yourself, is that what I really mean? It creates an ambiguity that you can easily solve, um, starting in Boston and ending in New York, rather than, rather than using between. But, um, so that's another way. Here we have the phrase up front, if damaged, and we haven't said what goods are damaged, that's the, the cause of the original ambiguity. Okay, clarity, moving on. Tip number three, change in language. Contract drafting 
sadly for a lot of us who are who do a lot of it is not a creative exercise <laughs> in brief writing you're trying to find that turn of phrase that beautiful adjective that you know the the thing that will sway the case or the jury in your in in your favor in contract drafting it's boring same word after same word even if you use it a hundred times because that's what makes it clear saying the same word to mean the same thing over and over and over means that you don't have ambiguities for example this is from an acquisition agreement maintenance seller shall maintain its plants structures and equipment in good operating condition until closing then subsection 2 non-compliance if seller fails to keep its plant structures and equipment in good condition, seller shall pay all necessary repair costs. The original obligation is good operating condition. The penalty refers to good condition. Is there no penalty for not keeping it in good operating condition? These are, once you choose a standard, once you choose a defined term, once you choose, even if it's not a defined term, once you choose a way to refer to something, repeat it over and over and root out alternate forms like a rabid dog because that's where you allow the other side to make an argument that this doesn't mean what your set what your client says it means use this creative writing is has no place in no place in contracts use the same word to describe the same thing um, it happens a lot with things like property and location and site you find yourself using synonyms to refer to the same thing. Obviously, one way to solve that is to use a defined term, to define property, and then use that term capitalized. And, and But again, using your defined term every single time it comes up is the defined term version of this. But it's important, even if you don't have a defined term, once you choose a way to, or, and especially a standard, best efforts, reasonable efforts, good faith efforts, once you choose a standard, don't change the way you express that standard. Okay. Questions? Other sources? Yes. Earlier, when you said about, um, you know, brief writing, and, you know, I sometimes suspect that people always, you know, like when you use the phrase in the course, so you think in the course of human events. We always crib from other writers. I know you could catch Dickens, Lincoln. We always try to show how cute and smart we are. So you think it would be a good idea to have the one do your, I mean, you know, subdivide your, your, either subdivide your mind or subdivide your office tasks by having one person do the drafting of the mundane things like a contract who's good in the detail and the other one who's good at words sticking it to the, uh, you know, the cute stuff like brief writing. Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I've, in the course of my career, I've done both. I've, I've been an employment lawyer, and I've done transactional work. And it is a completely different mindset. Um, in, in transactional work, detail is everything. Less so than, than, not having, than having separate people do it, I think it's important to recognize in yourself what your strengths are. Um, I have students who are bright and, and understand the deal and understand the imperatives in representing a client in a transaction. Details are not their gig. They, the, the formatting, the organization, the use of the same word over and over and over, it's not how their mind works. And I think to be a good transactional lawyer, you have to be, and you know, everybody jokes about the, you know, the deal that turned on a comma. I could have hauled in here five cases where the deal did, in fact, turn on a comma. I mean, the fact of the matter is that does happen. But I think if, you, if your mind doesn't work that way, I don't think transactional work is for you. Um, I do think that transactional lawyers are capable of turning on the flowery prose that, that you need. But I think it's important to say to yourself, or at least to recognize in yourself where your strengths are and which task you're doing that day. Um, but I think the fact that, that large law firms have organized into corporate departments and litigation departments is no accident. I think people gravitate to one sort of work or another. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's no question. I mean, employee handbooks, things, things that require explanation, 
and require. And the other thing about contract drafting is the, which I don't think you have to do as much in litigation. Obviously, you have to strategize in litigation, but in contract drafting, you have to sort of blow the deal up in your head in advance. What could go wrong? And then draft today so that that doesn't happen, or at least to protect your client in the event that it does happen. Because obviously, there are some things that you can't prevent from happening. But that ability to think into the future and blow the deal up in your head is essential to, and, and that's just like writing an employee handbook. What situations could come up, and for the time of my career that I was an, employee, an, an employment lawyer, if there's a situation that you can imagine, an employee will do it at some point it, in, in your career. You think there's no way anybody's ever going to do this or ever going to think this or ever going to ask for this. Absolutely, it will happen in the next month after you decide not to write that into the employee handbook. But a how-to manual is a very good analogy for a contract because it is what the clients are going to pick up and say, what do I have to do today with respect to this contract? What are my obligations now that this has arisen? What do I have to do? Things like, for instance, evergreen clauses in contracts. Renewal um, without the parties having to do anything. If nobody gives notice within 60 days of the termination date, the contract renews. Oh my God, evergreen clauses make my blood run cold. And in fact, in representing clients, I have taken into account the personality of the client in deciding whether or not to write an evergreen clause. If you ask a client whether you should put an evergreen clause in, they will say probably, unless you're dealing with sophisticated in-house counsel, probably nine times out of ten, yeah, put that in, great, then I won't have to do anything and we can just keep going. Only if you want to be locked in for another five years if you forget to send the notice. Literally, clients who are on top, uh, when they get letters from me, they respond. When I meet with them, they have an organized folders of things. For those clients, I draft evergreen clauses. For the ones who never, who can never find what I sent them, or and, and because they're busy business people, that's not a, that's not a knock. I would never draft to draft an evergreen clause. Literally, for me, the evergreen clause is a judgment about whether or not I think my client will remember to send that notice four years from now. And so you do have to think ahead what could go wrong and how is my client going to use this document. So, and I, I'm getting totally off the clarity thing here, but the other thing I think in, in contract drafting that you really have to think about is email. Email, it, clients, and, and understandably so, clients, there are notice provisions in contracts all the time. Some of them are basic, you know, you, you give somebody notice, you send them, you know, how many you want for this month. Some, like evergreen clauses or notices of breach or things like that, are incredibly important notices. And clients probably would like everything to be an email notice now. It's easy, you know, they can, they can dash it off. Not for me. Email stuff only for things that I don't anticipate becoming a source of a dispute. What's the big problem with email? Spam. I, spam. I sent it and the other side says, I never got it. And, and how do you prove that? You're not going to get, in, in the course of contract administration, you're not going to get some judge to give you an order to go through their hard drive and figure out whether or not they got it. Um, that, that and, and again, we're talking about your clients using this contract and not having hassles, not trying to prove that somebody didn't get an email. If, an, if a notice is important, stay the heck away from email. And I think it's, I think it's easy in our, um, in our desire to please clients that, uh, that you want to put in an email notice, but it's up to you to make the judgment as to when this is important enough, I need to have a verifiable way to tell that this, that this notice has been given or this order was sent or, or something like that. But I digress. Sorry, too many, too many things. All right, another, another um, fertile area for ambiguities is anytime you're talking about combined persons or combined actions. Example one. The chair and vice chair may nominate up to three candidates for admission. Problem? Exactly. Can, can, can the chair nominate three and the vice chair nominate three, or together do they nominate three? This is an example of a combined person problem, where you have to be very, once, when any time there are combined people, you want to say to yourself, okay, now I have to think carefully about making sure that I'm expressing what we need. The chair and vice chair may each nominate up to three candidates for admission, or the chair and vice chair may together 
nominate up to three candidates for admission. That word is the difference between your clients being in a dispute over that provision and your, clients, and your client not being in a dispute over that provision. So combined people, source of ambiguity. Combined actions. For this weekend only, employees may apply to work overtime on Saturday or Sunday. Because only a limited number of positions are available, employers shall award the work to employees on the basis of seniority. Combined actions. What are the combined actions here that give rise to an ambiguity? Anybody? Yes. Whether they're applying only on this weekend or whether they're working, working. only on this weekend. Right. Those are the combined actions. Applying, applying to work. They're doing two actions, and you're saying you can only do that on Saturday and Sunday. Which one does it mean? So the way to take care of this is to take care of application in one sentence, take care of when the work happens in another sentence. Combined actions often end up in, in ambiguities. Questions about that? We're back to, in, in E, we're back to my fa one of my favorite contracting, contract drafting tools, the list. Just like you can use lists to promote brevity, you can use lists to promote clarity. Example one, this leave policy applies to pregnant production department employees, shipping department employees, and R&D employees who have not otherwise exhausted their optional leave time. Ambiguity? Anybody on this side of the room feeling, feeling ambiguous? Exactly. If you're, if you're not in the production department, we could care less whether you're pregnant or not. The que here, the question is, does pregnant apply only to production department employees, or does it also modify shipping department and R&D employees? The same is true at the end of that clause. What's the other ambiguity at the very end? Have otherwise exhausted their optional leave time. Right. Or does every, do employees in all the departments have to have exhausted their optional leave time? You see the redraft. Things that you want to apply to all departments go in the introductory clause. That's the, that's the basic list rule about lists. You all know it. If you want it to apply to everything, it goes in the introductory clause. The way I've drafted this is we only care if the R&D employees who have not otherwise exhausted their optional leave time. That's what, that's what, the, what, the, uh, what the redraft says. If I wanted every employees in all the departments to have exhausted their optional leave time, I would have put that in the, in the introductory clause too. But here, pregnant goes in the introductory clause because I'm pretty certain that what they meant was pregnant employees in all of those departments. But again, a list helps you avoid the ambiguity and is enormously user-friendly. Example two, employees with less than 10 years seniority are not eligible to hold first shift jobs unless the shift supervisor consents in writing. No employee with less than four hours of OSHA disaster response training is eligible for first shift jobs. This one's a little more obscure. Anybody feeling obscure today? That they um, uh, are inclusive or exclusive. Right. If you, if you have tenure seniority and, or supervisory consent, do you still need four hours of OSHA disaster response training, right? I, do you have to have both of those? And I think, if I'm looking, I would think that the, that the answer is yes, that you, that you still have to have both. But starting with, again, we talk about the, the um, dra drafting actively rather than passively, starting with the what the employer's obligation is. Employer shall only assign first shift jobs to employees who have A, at least 10 years seniority or supervisory consent in writing, and at least four hours of OSHA disaster response training. Every list should have a connector, either and or or, depending on whether or not you mean to be inclusive or exclusive. Note the other thing that I did in the redraft. The original says, employees with less than 10 years seniority are not eligible to hold first shift jobs. When I redrafted, I said, to employees who have at least 10 years seniority. If I had just written 10 years seniority, who am I eliminating? Okay. 11, I'm eliminating 10, with, 10 in one day, too. Exact, so when you're talking about years of experience or amount of time, 
it's it's very important to think about the at least or no more than because we certainly don't mean in this that you have to have dead spot on 10 years of seniority, right? You certainly mean that you can't have less, but so at least 10 years of seniority accurately states what we're after here. Also, at least four hours of OSHA disaster response training. Although, having been through some OSHA training, my heart goes out to anyone who has more than four hours of OSHA disaster response training. <laughs> but uh, if, so, if someone happened to have 10, they would still be eligible for a first shift job. Questions about that? Okay, drafting tool issues. We get into ambiguities by inconsistent use of, of drafting tools. First, the covenant debate. Covenants, of course, are the basic building block of a contract. A contracts are a set of instructions about who is required to do what. A covenant is how you express an obligation for someone to do something. Do you draft that with shall? Do you draft that with will? Do you draft that with must? Um, I teach my students shall up one side, down the other, never shall deviate from shall. Um, it's, it's directive, will is not as directive as shall. Must would serve exactly the same purpose as shall. The important thing, and I'm not gonna stand here and tell you there's some legal difference between shall and must, but the important thing is not to mutate between the two because then you, you open up your document to, well, if you said shall here and you said must here, you must have meant something different. So whatever word you choose to express your covenants, use it consistently. I'm a huge fan of shall, but I can't tell you that there's a legal difference in must. I think there is a legal difference in will. I think will expresses how something will be in the future and not a directive obligation. Um, certainly, if you put 50 lawyers in a room, you'd probably get 50 opinions on that. But I'm just telling you what I think the best practice is. We teach the students at Case to use shall uh, with a but within, even within covenants, you have po potential for ambiguities. We've already talked about received covenants. Seller shall receive $50,000 by wire transfer on the effective date. You've all seen this in contracts on your system. It says that the seller shall receive. It does not say that the buyer shall pay. Not, not the obligation that we're trying to express. Another one that I think happens all the time are inanimate object covenants. IOCs, as my students learn on their papers, when I write IOC, IOC on the first paper. By the second paper, no more IOCs. The plumbing shall comply with local and state regulations. The plumbing can't comply with anything. The plumbing has no arms. Uh, someone has to make the plumbing comply with state and local regulations. And I think inanimate object covenants are, are one of the worst errors in contract drafting. I think people want to say what the thing must be instead of who must make the thing be. And paying attention to that will save your client life because the plumbing shall comply with state and local regulations. If you've got a contractor and a sub, you've got, you've got a dispute about whose responsibility it was to make the contract comply with state and local regulations. Always, always, always start with the actor. In, in, you know, you've heard that since the fourth grade. You know, don't write passively. Start the sentence with the with the actor. In contract drafting, it has real consequences not to start with the actor. Non-party covenants, another another problematic source in in contracts. For example, if we had a construction contract between the landowner and the building contractor, so the landowner says, "Build me this building," and enters into a contract with the building contractor to build it. But the, the landowner has hired an architect to develop building plans. And the contract between the landowner and the building contractor says, the architect shall deliver the final plans to contractor no later than 5 o'clock on May 9, 2012. What, what's the problem with giving the contractor? Yeah, there's no signature line on the contract for the architect. So you can write that, that covenant from now until the dogs come home and there's nobody there to enforce it against. So you have to figure out how to draft those with the parties in front of you. Who's the party that controls the architect here? The landowner, right? So you draft that covenant by saying, the landowner shall ensure that the architect delivers. 
you could write that you could write that covenant for the landowner itself. The landowner shall deliver, meaning you have to go get it from the architect and deliver. But if you what you're anticipating is that the architect will make the actual delivery, the way to draft that that covenant is with the parties you have before you, and that it, it's all this. Another place that this comes up is when you're talking about employees. When the party to the contract is an entity, individual employees are not signatories to the contract. If you want a, an entity to a contract to ensure that a particular employee does something, the correct way to do that is to say, company shall ensure that its CEO does this. Saying CEO shall doesn't get you there because the CEO is not signing the contract. In theory, the CEO might be signing on behalf of the company, but still, it's not an individualized. So I think you need to be very careful, especially when you have entity parties, about still writing the covenant for the entity. And if you need a particular, per if it's important that a particular individual do something, just have the entity ensure that that particular individual will do it. That's the, cl that's the way to avoid ambiguity about a non-party covenant. Passive voice, we've talked about. The building, this is the classic formulation of passive voice, the building material shall be delivered, starting with the object of the sentence, not the actor. It doesn't tell you who has to perform that covenant, contractor shall deliver the building materials, or owner shall deliver the building materials, whatever it is, passive voice leaves you without knowing who's in breach if the building materials don't get delivered. Questions about covenant clarity issues? Rights. Rights are exactly what they sound. They're something that someone has the discretion to do, but is not in breach if they don't do it. I, t I tell my students to draft rights with may. Inevitably, we see dra rights drafted with shall have the right to, shall have the opportunity to, shall be entitled to. This violates our brevity rule of never use five words when one will do. May gets you there every time. It's not directive, it gives somebody a right, and it doesn't take five words to express a right. And it also, in, in terms of clarity, it's the same word to refer to the same thing every time. Shall have the right to and shall be entitled to. If you're, if you're jumping back and forth between those, it raises the question of whether or not you mean the same thing. So obviously a right vests discretion and not a duty to act. Declarations. Declarations are probably one of the least understood drafting tools and, and a, a frequent source of ambiguities. A declaration is a statement by both parties together that a statement is true, that a fact is true. So both parties together are saying this is true, we're saying it together. The classic examples of a declaration are, for instance, the term of the contract. This agreement commences on May 8th. 2000 and, and terminates on this. There's no shall, there's no may, there's no rep, there's no warranty. The parties together are saying, it's true that this contract starts on this date and ends on this date. Define terms are declarations. This word means this. Both parties together saying this fact, this, this word means this. This fact is true. Um, boilerplate provisions are often written as declarations, choice of law. Um, this contract is governed by the law of the state of Ohio, whatever your formulation of that, of that boilerplate provision is. Declarations often get confused with covenants. Oftentimes a drafter will say, well, of course we both expect, you know, that of course this person is going to do this. So they draft what should be a covenant as a declaration. We're, we're drafting a franchise agreement. Of course, he's giving me the franchise. So what I draft is franchisee has the franchise to operate five restaurants within the city limits of the city of Cleveland, Ohio. That's a declaration. There's no, there's no obligation. Unfortunately, that's not a true fact until the franchisor grants the franchise to the franchisee. So that's confusing a declaration with a covenant. That, that clause should read, franchisor grants to franchisee the franchise to operate five restaurants within the city limits of Cleveland. Even if you expect somebody to act, 
you want them obligated to act rather than both parties saying that the result is true. Questions about that? If somebody needs to act, use a, use a covenant. It's e declarations are even more often confused with representations. If one party has knowledge, that party should be making a representation, even if the other party could go out and verify that it's true. Let's take my employment contract with Case. Case wants in, in my employment contract to know that I graduated from the University of Michigan Law School. That should not be drafted as a declaration, even though Case could go call Michigan and find out whether I did. Who is taking the risk that I didn't? A, re a representation is a risk, risk shifting device. Case wants me to take the risk that it's not true, wants me to assure them that I graduated from the University of Michigan. So that should be drafted. Seymour represents that she graduated from the University of Michigan Law School in, oh, in 1985. Oh my god. <laughs> See what happens? Draft short, br brief sentences, don't put the year in. Um, so, so that sentence should not be drafted as a declaration even though case could go ascertain its truth. If one party has knowledge and the other does not, use a representation. It's easy to get caught up in drafting declarations because you're thinking, well, sure, of course. I, for instance, I just had mm, this semester, last semester, my students were drafting a, an advertising agreement. between A local restaurant wanted to advertise on the football scoreboard at the local high school, or it's the varsity and JV field, so two football scoreboards. Where the football fields were located and the fact that scoreboards were at the end of both of these football fields, large numbers of my students drafted those as declarations. And my comments to them were, well, sure, the, the restaurant could go look at that, but they're not the ones, A, who, ha who know it, and B, who control it. So they want the, re they want the high school, or the, the school board, I guess it was, to represent to them there is a high school football field, there is a JV football field, and there is a, a scoreboard at the end of each. So using a declaration where you need a representation is another, another point where you end up with, with ambiguities as to who's actually, yes? You stumbled, onto something. you stumbled onto something about which people may differ, so I'm interested in your advice. Before you talked about using shell, directive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm clear brief. Here you talked about a proper way to draft the franchise grant. You said franchise or grants. So there are instances oh. where the choice of a verb grants rather than the statement franchise or shell grant Absolutely. is a should fascinating be debate. If I, said, if I said grants, that's horrific drafting standing up here at the podium. It should be. Absolutely. I would, if, if one of my students wrote franchise or grants, I'd, I'd cross it out and put shell grant. Absolutely. No question. You're open, I, are you open to the fact that there'd be debate among lawyers about that that I don't, advice? I, I think there will be debate about that until the cows come home. Right. Because, but franchise or grants is a declaration. It doesn't direct the franchisor to do anything. But I, I think absolutely. I think there are people who would say the, that that he's doing it. That that's a, that's absolutely a, a. I think that in in terms of best practices, though. You know, for instance, can I stand here and tell you I've read six cases where using a declaration there resulted in a horrific verdict against the franchisor because he didn't No. But if we're talking about best practices, shall grant is bulletproof, right? Grants, you know, you could, we can argue about that until the cows come home. Shall grant is, is I think, the way to go. That means that the franchisor has to do another act. Why wouldn't you want the contract to just say franchise or hereby grants five, right, so it's all in one contract? Well, I don't know that the, that the franchisor has to do anything more rather than if, they, if you say shall grant, right? Because then, then the, the franchise, what, what more would the franchisor have to do? Make the grant. Have a separate document where you then say franchise or hereby grants? Secured party grants too, and that's a present thing that happens right then when the contract is signed versus the secured or the uh, debtor shell grant, which means there's a future. 
that it's, even when even when the shall grant doesn't express a future time. But it does. See, that's the oh, problem. Oh well, certainly, if you're writing franchise or shall grant in May 2000, you well, know, in June just 2012, using just using it. shall grant, I think evidence is a future event that must yeah, occur. See, I, and I think that's I think that is a debate that now the hereby grants. I think is a secure transaction to hereby grants. grants and then as soon as the contracts granted the security interest is granted right right well that yeah no and I think you're right I think that's a debate that that rages on um, I do think that you that that the value of using the same word to express covenants every time is is important but that right the thing that's supposed to happen as of that moment whether or not a a declaration happens. I, the thing I struggle with is when you're writing franchise or grants, you're writing a declaration, the other party doesn't have any knowledge or, or any power to participate in saying that statement is true. So it, it may be that, that, that's, that the, the thing that's supposed to happen as of that agreement as opposed to a future action is the thing that we don't have a good drafting tool for, or perhaps hereby is the way to, is the way to solve that. I think that's a good point. Oh, I was supposed to leave time for questions. So. We've had plenty of questions? Okay, all right, all right. I was just looking at the clock and thinking, oh, no, violating the rules. Okay, um, dates and time. Uh, this is another, this is, this is a place where, the, I mean, and you know, this has, dates and time, could, you can end up with ambiguities all the time. Employer shall pay severance pay to terminate employees who sign the ADA waiver form between May 15th and May 31st. Are, do you really mean May 16th to May 30th? We talked about the, the evils of the word between. Write what you mean. From May 15th, 2012 through May 31st, 2012. From and through are the ways to, you know, and, and you can do on and, on and after and on and before, things like that. Again, those to me are using more words than you need to express what you can express through from and through. Um, Seller shall purchase all its paint from May 15th to May 31st, 2012. Same ambiguity. Are we just going up to May 31st or is May 31st included? Through is the word that solves both the between and the to problems. In both of these examples, we also have the time issue. One thing I hammer to my students is if you draft dates, you draft times. You never draft a date without drafting times because in theory, if the, if the employees have to sign the ADEA waiver form from May 15th through May 31st, through May 31st, 2012 is what time? 11.59.59. And the employer's probably not open then, and nobody wants to hang out so they can. So why leave that open? Every time you draft a date, draft the time. Now, you can solve some of that with defined terms. A business day means from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Mondays through Fridays, excluding holidays recognized by the United States Postal Service, um, something like that. You can take care of a lot of the time issues by paying attention in your defined terms, but if you're drafting dates, also draft times so that somebody's not obligated to do something. Or, for instance, one of the, one of the hypotheticals I have my students do is a timber harvesting agreement. See, don't you wish you were in law school? Look at all these things you could be doing. Timber harvesting. Somebody has a huge estate, wants the trees thinned out, hires somebody to do it. And one of the time points in that assignment that I made to my students is this, your client, no more wants them showing up at 7 a.m. than they want to stick a stick in their eye. So time as to when the harvesting can start and when the harvesting can end on every day was very important. And so drafting days without times would be a big error in that, in that contract. Um, example three, owner shall deliver a copy of the architectural plans to contractor within three days after the signing of this contract. Ambiguity, three days. Oh, if they oh that's true. I didn't think about this if the signing if the signing were different days. I was thinking calendar versus business days. You always have the weekend holiday problem. So uh, again, I say to my, just like I say, don't draft days without times, you never draft day without saying calendar day or business day. Every, it, 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 and with computers, one of the great things is you can do a find and replace.
for day. You can you just write along, try and remember it, but at the end, one of your fail safes should be run a find and replace for day, and if you've, all you've got is day and not calendar or business in front of it, fix it, because that's when you're counting days, people say, oh, I meant it to be, I, there, I, when, I, when I teach this, I show a, a, a video from Scary Movie 3, that cinematic triumph, and, and there's a, it, it's, it's, somebody, the phone rings, and then the guy tells him when, when they're going to, he's going to come and kill her. And she starts arguing with him. He says, I'm going to kill you in three days. She says, three days? Three business days? Three calendar days? Does that include the holiday? It's Martin Luther King Day. He says, no, I don't observe. And, you know, they, so they have a whole argument about whether or not, anyway. Uh, it's, she's arguing with her potential murder about whether Martin Luther King Day should be observed. But Okay, I have the big T for time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. it was, uh, this was fun.